Okay, uh, great job on exam one. Uh, I thought that was a very hard exam, and I had no idea how you guys were going to handle it, particularly because we did not have a lot of problems for you to practice on, which is a big problem because there is no textbook out there that covers phosphorus and sulfur chemistry, and that is one of the most common sets of reactions that you do in the lab, actually. So that's the misfortune. And I think we're going to address this issue of not having enough problems to practice on in this section because we're talking about paracyclic reactions. And there is book after book after book that has great treatments of paracyclic processes. So let me remind you of where we're at. We're, in this class, we're going to talk about four classes of paracyclic reactions. So you can group pretty much every type of paracyclic reaction into one of these four groups. Uh, and we're still talking about cycloaddition reactions. So we spent the last couple of lectures talking about, in particular, 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reactions, uh, the Diels-Alder reaction, hetero diels alder reactions, and inverse electron demand diels alder reactions, and the orbital symmetry considerations that go along with that. And we're going to continue on with this idea of using orbital symmetry to help us understand these four classes. So I want to try to finish up cycloadditions today. Um, and what we really want to do is go beyond the 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. <coughs> I'm not going to draw the picture of homos and lumos right now. Uh, I just want to get across this point that if you think about cycloaddition reactions where one component comes down on the face of another component in a simple face-to-face -face manner, really, if you want that to be an easy transition state, it needs to be suprafacial and superfacial, where top face reacts with bottom face or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> the only, really, the most common systems, if you look at this number, 4n plus 2, where n is some in integer, what I'm really telling you is that these are the common pair, are the symmetry allowed superfacial, superfacial uh, paracyclic reactions? I'm not going to go beyond this, but reactions where there's two total pi electrons, 6, 10, 14, these are the ones that are symmetry allowed in a superfacial, superfacial manner. Uh, and they're only common, um, really, in this case, two electron and six electron <coughs> processes. Yeah, in theory, you can have a 10 electron process or a 14 electron process, but you're not going to use those reactions and you're not going to see them in the lab. So we're not going to spend time talking about that. I'll show you one example uh, of one of the less common processes. Uh, and then we'll just kind of make that the, um, the end of our discussion. And the problem is that we simply don't have enough time uh, to talk about all of these processes. So you could imagine that this could undergo a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. But in the most common implementations of this, when you take a simple diene with this system called a fulvine, so this particular molecule is called fulvine, this undergoes a reaction at these two carbons. So the second component acts like a 6 pi system. And if I erase this bond, it would be easier to see how it's kind of like a 6 pi system. And the product that you get out of this has a seven-membered ring attached to a five-membered ring. There, there's a class of terpene natural products called guaiines that have this skeleton. So if I go ahead and push the electrons here, there's a lot of electrons to push. You'll see that the initial product is this, uh, is this seven five ring system that looks like this. There's a hydrogen atom here now that will quickly move around that ring. We'll talk about that reaction. That's another paracyclic process. OK, so processes like this 10 electron process, 4 plus 4 pi electron plus 6 pi electrons are possible, hypothetically, face to face, without having to come from some weird angle. But you're just, it's just really not common. There are very few examples of 10 or 14 or 18 electron processes. OK, so I said 2 electron processes and 6 electron processes are common. And it may not be obvious to you, what's this two electron thing? How many of you have seen two electron? You've, you've seen these a lot. You just don't know it. Let's take a, an example of a two electron um, process. And I'm going to start by, with a simple question. Uh, 
Let's imagine taking a, a carbocation and reacting it with this enamine. And we'll think about the different pathways that this could follow. And so this would be the final product, would be substituting this at, at the unsubstituted position of the enamine. So obviously there needs to be some base here that pulls the proton off. That's not really the important thing. Okay, so uh, some sort of cation addition to an enamine. You know enamines are nucleophilic, carbocations. It could be a stabilized carbocation with an oxygen substituent like an oxycarbenium ion. Um, that's not really important. The important part is Wait, isn't the nucleophilic part of an enamine on this carbon down here? Right, does this R group really add first to this carbon? We'll call it carbon A. Or does the reaction involve reaction with carbon B followed by some sort of a 1-2 shift? So in other words, maybe what's happening here is that this carbocation is initially adding to this position. And then there's some 1, 2 shift um, over to that other carbon. And which of these mechanisms is correct? We could spend a lot of time arguing about this. It's hard to know. Carbocation 1, 2 shifts, what we'll see about those is they're fast, very fast reactions. Uh, let me try to sort of kill all of this discussion and, uh, and argument here. And what I'll do is I'll just remind you of what the transition state for this interaction has to look like. In fact, you already know what the transition state looks like. You, you learned about this in sophomore organic chemistry. So if I draw any double bond, it doesn't matter whether this is an enamine or an enol ether or a simple alkene. The phasing for those pi electrons for the HOMO looks like this. And the important part is these two carbon atoms on that enamine have the same phasing. There's, there's another part of the HOMO here that, that has opposite phasing, but that's not important. The important part is these two carbons have the same phasing. And any electrophile, whether it's Br2 or a carbocation that comes down and interacts with this, has to interact simultaneously with those two carbons. There is no way for you to get close to this carbon without also being close to this other one. There will be a bonding interaction as a carbocation comes down and lands on top of the, uh, these carbons. So in a way, it's kind of moot to talk about, well, does it react only with A or only with B or what's the, uh, what you'll end up finding is that the, trans, you know, the, the transition state for simple addition to A versus addition to B and migration to A, uh, those transition states are very similar in energy. You would have a hard time with calculations finding that, those transition states. Okay, so two electron processes, just simple additions of cations to alkenes are very common. It's a cyclo addition, whether you want to think about it that way or not. Okay, so let's talk about, um, I'll just mention some of the alternatives then. What are some other higher order processes or alternative processes to the classical four plus two cyclo addition? So what about four electron processes? And we mentioned this already when we talked about orbital symmetry. So if one of the components reacts anterofacially, that is allowed by orbital symmetry. I, I showed you in an earlier lecture this 4 plus 4 cycle addition. But it requires some weird geometry where one of the two reactants has to react simultaneously on both the bottom face and the top face. And this is not common. So I, I could dig up some examples, but they're just not going to be uh, common reactions. And so it's not worth our time to spend more time talking about that. The other type of uh, cyclo addition that's, um, or the other way to go beyond this 4n plus 2 rule is to do photochemistry. That should be states. And to generate some sort of an excited state. 
if one of your components is in an excited state, then it's easy to have 4n pi electrons involved in the transition state, a paracyclic reaction, a cycloaddition that involves 4n electrons. And so this would also be symmetry allowed. This is not quite as, as easy to see, and so I'll, I'll draw out some example for you. 4n electrons, I mean, I did draw a 4n electron process earlier with ethylene plus ethylene. Uh, let me just try to make this a little bit more interesting. This would be an example of a cycloaddition that involves four pi electrons. So I've got a two electron component down here, that's ethylene. And this allocation is also a two electron component. There's only two electrons, two pi type electrons in an allocation. But you can't, in a normal thermal reaction, generate five membered rings through this process, through a concerted paracyclic reaction. It's not possible. And if we draw out the orbitals for this, That's the way you draw the HOMO slash LUMO for an allyl system through a three carbon allyl system. And I'm not going to draw the HOMO yet for this. To, you know what the HOMO for ethylene looks like. The phasing is the same on the top. There's no way to simultaneously form bonds by reacting with one phase if we're in a ground state reaction. So the trick is if you want this to work out, what you do is you push an electron into the excited state for ethylene. If one electron is in the excited state, now we get to think about the excited state, and I'm going to draw brackets around that ethylene just to remind us that that's an excited state. If you push an electron into the excited state with a photon, with light, now the symmetry works out. So with excited states, you can have four electron processes, or eight electron processes, or 12 electron. They follow the 4n rule. So that's symmetry allowed when we have an excited state involved, that little asterisk. I mean, okay, so the problem is, we haven't yet covered photochemistry. And so you're going to have to wait for me to talk about excited state paracyclic processes until we talk about photochemistry because most photochemistry goes through something called a triplet and that means stepwise radical reactions. Most photochemical reactions are not paracyclic. Um, they involve radical processes and, and multi-step reaction mechanisms. Okay, so um, let's talk about the other types of cycloadditions that are common. We're going to talk about dipolar cycloaddition reactions. Okay, so there's lots of higher order, 10 electron, 14, but I, I say lots, but they're, I mean, meaning I could find examples, but they're nowhere near as common as six electron processes. Let me switch pens here. Okay, so let's talk about the other common six electron reaction or the other common class of six electron cycloaddition reactions. And that's the three plus two cycloaddition. And more commonly, we call this a three plus two dipolar cycloaddition. Because invariably, these reactions proceed using some sort of a dipole uh, reaction intermediate. So let me introduce you to a class of reactants, 1,3 dipoles, uh, that you can always draw as some sort of an illid. So let me go ahead and um, draw out the diene component in Diels Alder reaction. So the, a simple diene in a Diels Alder reaction acts as a four pi electron superfacial component. And I can draw a three atom system that does the same thing. Kind of like that owl cation, except I have to put electrons in there. And I'm going to take a 1,3 dipole that you've seen since sophomore organic chemistry, since your second year of organic chemistry. And maybe you didn't realize this was a cycloaddition reaction, um, but it's a cycloaddition reaction. That's ozone. And you probably have all, I expect that all of you have learned about ozonolysis of double bonds. <clears throat> now, if I have three bonds to oxygen, there needs to be a positive charge. This end is an oxido group. That's an illid. Whenever there's two charged atoms next to each other, we call that an illid, or the structure we refer to an illid. 
There's another way to draw this in which the charges are at opposite ends. I can draw a resonance structure, and we refer to that resonance structure as a 1-3 dipole. So there's the illid-like resonance structure where the charges are next to each other. And if I simply take these electrons and then get them here, then you can see that there's another resonance structure that puts the charges at opposite ends. And I'll draw the, the electron pairs on all the atoms now. Okay, so ozone is a 1,3 dipole. And it's going to undergo cycloaddition reactions following the same rules as butadiene, as that four electron diene component. So hopefully you've seen before reactions in which you take um, alkenes and ozone. Maybe you never drew the, the full mechanism for this. So it doesn't matter which of these resonance structures I draw. I'm going to generate the same product when I do this. But if I take these electrons and I attack, bring those electrons there, and what I end up with at the end is a 5 ring. Yeah, and like all peroxide compounds, this is very unstable and will react further. In fact, the subsequent reactions of this are really interesting. It's more retro cycloaddition reactions. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and talk about some common 1 3 dipoles. So ozone probably, I'd say, is one of the, um, the most common that you learn about in organic chemistry early on. It's not the most useful reaction in, in organic synthesis because it doesn't generate carbon-carbon bonds. So the 1,3 dipoles that you're going to see used you just type in 1,3 dipolar cycle addition on the web, um, or go to either look bent or linear. And really, what I'm, when I say bent or linear, what I'm telling you is they're either going to look like an allyl anion in terms of the hybridization, or they're going to look like a propartial anion in terms of hybridization. Right? When I do it like this, there's two four electrons with an allyl anion, there's two four electrons with a propartial anion. So in these cases, they'll look like this 4 pi electron component, butadiene, that you're familiar with. So let's take a look at some common examples um, of these kind of allyl anion looking 1,3 dipoles. What are the common 1,3 dipoles that you'll see used for dipolar cycloaddition reactions? And they all have these really peculiar names that aren't really that peculiar once you learn I'm not sure I don't care if you look at this one. Try to make this a little bit clean right here. <clears throat> okay, this one is called an azomethine illid. And you can see one of the advantages of this azomethine illid is that it's ready to form two carbon carbon bonds simultaneously. Very common because of that fact that it can form two carbon carbon bonds simultaneously. Both ends are carbon atoms. Now I'll come over here and I'll draw some other. Uh, semi-common 1,3 dipoles. And again, I'm drawing the illid resonance structure. There's another resonance structure that you could draw that would put the charges on the one position and the position. I'm drawing the illid resonance structure because it looks more like this diamond. Okay, this is called a carbonyl illid. See why that's called a carbonyl illid. It's a carbonyl with a carbanion attached to it. Far more common than that is this species called a nitrone. That's ready to form a carbon bond and an ox a carbon carbon and a carbon oxygen bond simultaneously. And then the last I'll draw out in this class of, of dipoles that look like Alanides is ozone, and you already know that. Okay, so there's carbonyl illids, nitrones, and ozone. Let me put the charges on ozone. Okay, so uh, those are the ones that are bent and have an sp2 hybridized uh, center atom. Let me draw some 1 3 dipoles that engage in dipolar cycloaddition reactions that look like propartial anions. We're going to need to see some triple bonds in here. So one, common illid structure, 
would be a diazo compound. So diazomethane, methyl diazoacetate. <clears throat> These diazo alkanes uh, can undergo cycloaddition reactions that are parasite. Diazo Another common functional group that can undergo dipolar cycloadditions is this species. It's called a nitrile oxide. So it looks like a nitrile, and there's an O minus attached to the nitrile. Then I'll draw the last common species. That, uh, um, you can see that I'm just taking either an allyl anion or a propargyl anion and replacing the carbons with heteroatoms. I'm sure you can dream up more combinations where you replace any of these atoms with nitrogen or oxygen. Um, they're just not all easy species to make. So what I'm drawing here are the common ones. So let me draw out the names here to try a identified your dipole as being nucleophilic, like this azomethine fillet, um, then you ought to predict it's going to react fastest with an electrophilic dipolarophile. That's what we call the alkene component. So in a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition, we call it diene and dienophile. In a dipolar cycloaddition, we call it um, dipole and dipole. Let me go ahead and draw out an example of a reaction. Not a moment. I'm trying to figure out how to draw this out because I need a lot of board space. So let me come over and switch boards here. I want to draw three reactions, three dipolar cycloaddition reactions, so we can compare them side by side. But I feel like it's super important for us to compare them side by side. So let me try to erase this. So if you want to think about BGO chemistry, let me go ahead and start off by drawing a 1,3-dipolar um, cycle addition. And when I look at this, this looks like a very nucleophilic illid to me. Look at all the carbon atoms. If 
I replace the carbon atoms with electronegative heteroatoms, I'd expect that to be electrophilic. And so when I react this with some sort of a dipolarophile in a 3 plus 2 cycloaddition, I would expect the best reaction if this nucleophilic <coughs> dipole reacts with an electrophilic dipolarophile. Right? That's going to lead to the fastest reaction rates. That would be my expectation. I guess the reason I'm drawing this dashed is there's always two different orientations I could draw. There's always another resonance structure where I could put the negative charge in a different place. And so the question is, what's the correct radiochemistry to expect out of this reaction? So I'm going to draw a, a molecular <coughs> orbital interaction diagram where, where I can diagram out the interaction between the dipole and the dipolarophile. And if I really believe that this is a nucleophilic dipole, Carbanions tend to be very nucleophilic. There's going to be a homo and a lumo. Because we're interested in the pi-like orbitals of this. I'm going to sketch out just kind of energetically the, um, the homo. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to draw a high energy homo here. If I really believe this is a, a very nucleophilic species, then I want to draw a high energy homo. And I already know that, that enones like this have low lumo. Take a, if you take some sort of a diene and replace an atom with oxygen, you look, raise and load, you kind of pinch in those orbitals. Or if I take some atom and I, carbon atom and replace it with oxygen, you're going to lower all the energy levels. And so if, if I were to draw this out, I would expect this interaction between this nucleophilic species and this electrophilic species to have one dominant homo lumo interaction. This is the nucleophile, this is the electrophile. Because of that small interaction, I'm going to generate new carbon-carbon bonds um, that are much lower in energy. I'm just going to, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just draw or diagram out the distance between these is small. I've got something that's nucleophilic, I've got something that's electrophilic. And that's not to say that there's not also another interaction between this homo and that lumo. It is true that this alkene is attacking that carbon, but that's not the dominant interaction. Yes, it has to be true, otherwise we would be concerted. We're forming two bonds at the same time. Now here's the, the trick. If, if you draw out the MO for the for these two species that are important, it's this homo and that lumo, not the other way around. If this is if this is the orbital that's mainly responsible for the speed and facility of this reaction, then if I draw the shape of that orbital, the phasing, the coefficients, then I ought to be able to predict the regio again. some circles above this to represent the, the p orbital contributions to the homo. So if I were to look at the shape of, of the homo, I'm not going to put the charges in here, it's just going to confuse things. So if I were to draw the, the shape of the orbital for these two species, so where is the coefficient biggest for the lumo of acrylate? On the top alpha carbon or the bottom beta carbon? <coughs> beta carbon. So if I draw the, the lumo for this, it's biggest on the beta carbon. Nucleophiles add fastest to, to the beta carbon. And so now we just need to know what does the homo look like uh, for this dipolarophile. And it turns out that it is, and I, I don't have numerical coefficients for you. It turns out that it is biggest on the bottom carbon. And the phasing looks like this. The phasing looks like an allyl anion phasing, where there's something close to a node or just a tiny little But the coefficient is biggest here on the bottom carbon, kind of consistent with this resonance structure. And the preferred regiochemistry is to have this carbon atom attack here and to have the one that has the R group on it um, attack at the alpha carbon. So this is the preferred regiochemistry. And you, if you knew what the homo looked like, you could predict the regiochemistry. And if you can't guess by drawing resonance structures, then you can do molecular orbital calculations. We've done that in discussion section. And very quickly see, what does the homo look like? It's very easy to do that. And maybe we should do that in the next session. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw another. I'm going to come over onto this side of the board and, and go to the other extreme. Instead of drawing out um, a nucleophilic 1,3 dipole, let me draw a very electrophilic 1,3 dipole. And as soon as I draw this, and I see
see all of those oxygen, electronegative oxygen heteroatoms. I'm thinking, this looks like an electrophilic one. We've got a very electronegative atoms here. And so you might expect that this is going to react fastest with a nucleophilic alkene. I right? call that the, the dipolarophile. I hate that word so much. The dipolarophile. The thing that reacts with the one we have. That kind of makes sense. I've taken carbon atoms out and I've replaced with very electronegative oxygen atoms. That's starting to look very electronegative to me. So I kind of expect that this is going to, um, if I diagram out now this, the, the MO interactions here, I draw some molecular orbital interaction diagram. I need to draw the HOMO and the LUMO for the dipole. And because I've replaced carbon with something that's electronegative, these orbitals are going to drop in energy. Let me just super magnify that. Now my home is way down here, pathetically non-nucleophilic. All those oxygen atoms, right up on the pair of electrons. I don't want to be involved in bonds. I'm happy near oxygen. It's electronegative. I've got this nucleophile, this alkene here. The pi system of that is very nucleophilic. And so I should expect when these things interact, there's one homo-lumo interaction that's going to be important. And that's the homo of the dipolarophile and the lumo of the dipole. So this is the dominant interaction when these two things come together and undergo a cycle of action. And if I wanted to correctly predict the regiochemistry here, I need to look at the shape, the phasing of, of the homo. Where is the coefficient phase? And I need to look at the shape or the phasing uh, for, for this lumo. And that will predict for me what's the preferred orientation. So again, there is an interaction between this HOMO and this LUMO way, way up here, right? It is true that this is also acting to form a bond and attacking that at the same time, right? At the same time that this is attacking there, this oxygen is also attacking it, forming two bonds at once. So it is true that this, this other interact, homo lumo interaction is important. If I sketch this out, I didn't leave myself any room at the bottom here, so I'll try to draw this in the middle. Here's my 1,3 dipole. Here's my dipole narrow file. And if I sketch out these orbitals here, you could probably predict where the orbital is biggest on this um, carbonyl oxide. I'm just trying to decide whether to draw this hash. OK, so when you have an alkene acting as a nucleophile, you're thinking about the HOMO. And the HOMO for a simple alkene has the same phasing. It doesn't matter that there's an octet, right? There's another orbital on the oxygen atom. I'm not going to draw that. I'm only going to draw the, or the, the orbitals above the carbons that are involved in bonding. And then when I look at the orbital interactions for this, for the HOMO, you'll find that it has the same phasing there. It's not always easy to predict what the shape of these 1, 3 dipoles looks like in terms of phasing. And so this is where it's very powerful that you know how to do electronic structure calculations, because it's very easy to just press the button and look at the orbitals and you can make a correct prediction. And so this allows you, this would allow you to predict that this, this card, you already knew that this end of the enol ether was more nucleophilic, I believe. And the idea here is that the most electrophilic end in terms of the shape of the LUMO um, is that above that carbon right there, and not on the oxygen. I kind of knew that nucleophiles don't want to pack that oxygen in, um, but if you do a different resonance structure, it might be harder to, think, uh, to draw that. Now there's going to be, there will be cases in which it's not so easy to predict. In fact, these are actually very common, the cases that are hard to predict. Let me draw the other resonance structure. So you can imagine this thing reacting this way. And when I sketch out this, you know, it doesn't have a lot of oxygen atoms, it doesn't have a lot of carbon atoms. It's kind of harder to decide whether um, this species is a nucleophile or electrophile. Now, fortunately, I'm using. A LUMO that has a, a, a 
dipolarophile that has a low energy lumo. Let me try to draw this thing down here. So by using this kind of a reactant, this dipolarophile here, I'm using something that intrinsically has a low energy lumo. The problem is this has enough heteroatoms. There's enough heteroatoms here that it drops the energy of the homo and the lumo. And there's no way you could know qualitatively. It's just not possible for you to have known qualitatively where these things land. <coughs> right? Consistent with the fact that it, maybe if I drew the other resonance structure, you'd have a harder time predicting. Let me draw the other resonance structure of this nitrone so it's possible for you to see that. If I draw it like this, it's easy for you to predict. But all I have to do is draw the other resonance structure. And now, doesn't it look kind of like this as the more nucleophilic carbon? Right? It's easy to get confused here. And good, because when you draw the MO interactions, it's not obvious from that either. You're, you're, the difficulty of predicting by using resonance structures is sort of backed up by the difficulty of predicting by looking at these MO interactions. It's hard to know which of these, which is the nucleophile and which is the electrophile. In theory, they're both nucleophile and electrophile because it forms two bonds simultaneously. So there's the easy cases to predict, there's the hard cases to predict, um, and if you, if you have some way, like on the quantum structure calculations, uh, predicting what those look like, <clears throat> and that's certainly the best way to do it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go a little further on this case where, um, where it's not always easy to predict. I'm going to show you that when you have cases where um, it's hard to tell what the regio chemistry is going to be, sometimes sterics can override any intrinsic preferences. Okay, so here's a nitrone cycloaddition. And there's two possible regiochemistries for this. You could have these things react like this. Or we could spin this around, and I think I'm... just one product, it, it, this simple cycloaddition between a nitrone and this, this enoate, you get a mixture of two. But this one is favored, about four to one ratio. So you still get a mixture. Quite often, in the most common examples of di dipolar cycloaddiction, you get mixtures. It's very common. <clears throat> but it's so close as to which end of this is reactive, whether it's the homo or the lumo that's most important for this. It's so close. You can easily override this with sterics. And I'm not going to draw the, the, um, um, the dipole again. I'm simply going to draw a different dipolarophile. And all we're doing, really, with this, with this enone is we're adding one extra substituent down here for the carbon. Just one extra CH2 group is really the big difference here. Right, they're both esters. I mean, you look at the, the interaction. Actually, I have to draw this out. Now what you find is that it's it's the other isomer that dominates. So when you look this up in the literature, they just tell you that this is the, the regional chemistry that's preferred. You get a 73% yield where this unhindered oxygen atom <coughs> reacts with this now hindered carbon. Right? By amping up the sterics here on this carbon atom, you make the oxygen atom want to add there more. It was so closely balanced here that that little steric change makes the unhindered oxygen want to add to that bottom carbon. Now, you don't know whether the other isomer was obtained at 27% yield or 0% yield. Right? They just chromatographed the thing they wanted it to the rest of the way. But it couldn't have been more than 27% of this minor isomer. So sterics, adding some sterics here makes the oxygen atom want to add to the bottom. That's what happens when things are finely balanced. Okay, so let's take a look at some more uh, 
cycle additions. How else can you tip the balance? And again, the more common dipolar cycle additions are, are these ones in between nucleophilic and electrophilic 1,3 dipoles, where it's hard to predict the regiochemistry. Let's take another look at this nitro. Again, that's a very common uh, class of dipolar cycle additions. Um, here's one of the most easy preparations. Maybe it's one of the reasons why it's so common to do nitro and dipolar cycle additions. You take a hydroxyamine, hydroxylamine, and you condense it with an aldehyde or a ketone, you get nitrones. So very easy to make nitrone intermediates. All you need is some sort of an aldehyde. You're ready to do dipolar cycle additions. <clears throat> Let me give you an example where you would expect almost no regio control. So if I just had an ethyl group versus a methyl group, right, there's no substantial difference. You'd expect to get a horrible mixture. I'm going to show you the temperature. It requires some heating on this. But if you attach this and do some sort of an intramolecular reaction, now, regardless of what you would have predicted, and this is very typical, regardless of where the homo or lumo was big here, it's this simple linker, the desire to form a five-membered ring, which is going to dominate the regio chemistry. This will never react in the opposite way, no matter what the coefficients look like. Because it's just too hard to arrange in some geometry where the oxygen adds here and the carbon adds at the bottom. So very commonly in intramolecular reactions, the substrate will, will dictate the regio chemistry, regardless of what the coefficients are. So that would be the preferred regio chemistry, simply because you want to form a five-membered carbocyl. Let's take a look at another uh, very common type of 1,3 dipole that's used in dipolar cycle addition. of roots to nitrile oxides. I'm going to draw one. I'm not sure you need to see the whole substrate, but this allows you to see uh, the substrate tolerance of this very common type of dipolar cycle addition. So this is a nitro group. And this is a precursor for making nitrile oxides. One of the most common Reagent combinations is to take an isocyanate and base. And the trick is here, you need some sort of a base um, to help remove the leading group and make the nitrile oxide. So you know, I've drawn this resonance structure where that's an O minus. You can add, imagine that attacking the isocyanate and converting this oxygen into a leading group. So you can imagine how you might do an elimination across here to remove that leading group. But there's a further reaction that this un that, that undergoes in order to remove the second proton from that position. And that's what generates the nitrile oxide intermediate. So there's the nitrile oxide intermediate. You have to remove the second proton using that base finally get to that nitrile oxide intermediate. And this is ready to undergo a addition uh, <coughs> reaction. Those little dots are visible. And again, the substrate is going to determine the regiochemistry. There's no, right, even though the benzene ring here is conjugated and will influence, you know, the HOMO is bigger here at the end carbon, the LUMO is bigger at the end carbon, but no matter what, you're going to get the regiochemistry that's dictated. There's no way for this to easily flip around and give you the opposite regiochemistry. Actually, I'm not going to draw the product. You can draw the product in the same way. Yeah, just to save this. Okay. Let's take a look 
at another uh, common example of a cyclo addition, and it's not so obvious what kind of cyclo addition. call this a dipolar cyclo addition. This substrate is kind of complex here, the important part. Because I've got a five carbon component, we get the oxygen that's not going to move on. And I've got a two carbon component. I've got a five atom component that's going to be So when you treat this with a base, it's an amidine base called DBN. It's about 100 times, several hundred times more nucleophilic or more basic than uh, just triethylene or other kind of bases. So you can kind of see how this is set up for you to do an elimination reaction, not concerted, not an E2 elimination, where the acetate leaves. Right, it's easy to push out the acetate. And then you pull a proton off of the cell phone. Proton and aluminum aren't on neighboring carbons. When you do that type of elimination, you'll get this reactive intermediate. And the term we use to describe this is an oxido beryllium billet. You write that down because it's a very weird name. Oxido, there's the oxido group. You can all see the oxido group dangling off of the six member ring. And there's something cationic because I've got the name Perillium. Um, and the trick is to know what the name of to know that this is called a pyran ring. That's called pyran, yeah. Six member ring with oxygen. This is called an oxidoperillium fillet. And this undergoes an intramolecular cycle addition. But the trick is, how do you really classify this? If I, if I draw out the product for this reaction, it's going to look kind of complex here. This is a powerful way to generate seven-member rings. <coughs> so you generate this seven-member ring. It's a bicyclic ring system. And as I'm drawing it here, it looks like a five plus two cycle addition reaction. But you could also interpret this differently just by drawing a different resonance structure. So there's some other stuff here that I'm not drawing. And the other way to draw a resonance structure would be to put the negative charge for the enolate on this carbon. You could also classify this very common 5 plus 2 cycle addition reaction as a 1-3 dipolar cycle. Cycle addition reactions with themselves. 
don't know if you can see this, but this is a dimer of cyclopentadiene. It's called dicyclopentadiene. Um, maybe many of you have used this in an undergraduate chemistry laboratory. When you want to do cycloaddition reactions with cyclopentadiene, um, <coughs> you can't just buy cyclopentadiene because it dimerizes with itself inside the bottle. So what you buy is this. And the first thing that you do is you heat this to very high temperatures. This is called cracking. And it undergoes a retro cycloaddition. It takes very high temperatures um, to access that transition state. And you just reverse the arrows. And it's the reverse of the Diels-Alder reaction. Um, and this, you can boil off in the reaction. It's got a boiling point of 42 degrees Celsius. So you just distill that off. It's very common to have retro cycloadditions when you want to access diamonds because it's hard to put diamonds in a bottle. Okay, when we come back on Wednesday, we're going to finish up um, retro cycloadditions. I'll have just a few more things to tell you. And it all is generally going to relate to the idea that retro cycloadditions are most common when you can generate an aromatic. I'll show you several things. If you want a fast saddle retro cycle addition that doesn't require 250 degrees, you can expect it's going to be called formation.